the glens. Nine glacial valleys molded in the Ice Age, cutting their way through the Antrim Mountains towards the Irish Sea. Situated in the northeast of Northern Ireland, they were once part of the ancient kingdom of Dalriada that included parts of Scotland, often visible just across the water. The kingdom is no more, but many of its myths and traditions survive. Ah! Told across four seasons, this is the story of moors and farmland, forests and rivers, of a proud people fighting to preserve their way of life. There are nine glens that make up the glens of Antrim, each with their own name and distinct character. It's a conversation between land and sea that began thousands of years ago. A story carried by cascading rivers, rushing down to historic villages that cling to the rugged coast. It's a tough land but it can be productive. And for many, the cycle of the seasons still map out the year. On the northern tip of the glens are the cliffs of Fairhead. Sean McBride and his son, Jared farm beef and sheep on this uncompromising landscape. No, I think we'll have to hose that one there. Maybe this one. Today, they're getting this year's spring calves ready for the autumn market in Armoy. Just give them a wee comb with a curry comb. Uh, maybe cut a wee bit of the long hair off the tail head. It's not necessary. It's just something you do to just make the cattle look as well as possible when they're going around the, the ring. Oh, if, I, if I've seen these ones out in the field, there's maybe eight, four or five of them. And if you just walk over and just set like this here and give them a wee rub, and they love it. Happy cows. The mums will miss them for a few days, but they do settle quite quickly. Sometimes you think they might be glad to get rid of them. They're, they're running out of milk at this time of the year. Calf to suckle. Time to move on. They're teenagers. <laughs> Six month old teenagers. This is Jess, the super dog. Best dog in the north of the Fowland here. Ah, oh, stop that. Because I've seen you eat poo earlier. Day. Just want a left? No, I won't. All right. The farm here has been in the family for, we can count, about 12 generations to the cow. Down on Taylor's little clacking, that's kind of where the family started. About 400 acres in the farm, so there's all together. Quite a hell of the environment. Fairly challenging maybe, but quite productive as well. Tonight's the last night in the farm for these calves. They'll go to other farms, he will raise them next summer and, and finish them through to beef. They've done the best they can here, so they need to move on. It's a, it's a cycle, really. But, uh, yeah. Away from the coast, high moorlands watch over the glens below. On 
on Glenwary Hill, just south of Glenarm, Ireland's only full-time grouse keeper is making his rounds. Grouse there, uh, look. Birds out in front. Right, uh, come, come with me. Originally from England, Alex is employed by the Irish Grouse Conservation Trust to manage around 1,000 acres of the moor. Since he started, grouse numbers have risen from just five pairs to well into the hundreds. They tend to sit that tight in Northern Ireland. You only really put them up when you're nearly standing on top of them. A lot of people, you know, say if you don't know a lot about the moors, you would think it was bleak, but actually manage moors, hold more, more wildlife than anywhere else. This is medicated grit. Grouse need some form of grit to digest the food. Here, because it's we're 80% blanket bog, there's not a lot of gritstone or sandstone or anything like that. There's you know no source of natural grit at all, and they rely on us putting grit out. Grouse mainly feed on these heather seeds here. The grit goes into the system, and then it goes into the gizzard. The gizzard is a muscle inside the gut. So it sits in the gizzard and then it almost acts like teeth and it grinds all the coarse seeds up and then push all the nutrients out of it. Well, it's October time. The grouse start to get a little bit more territorial. So you'll hear your cockbirds, they'll start cackling. And it's, a, it's a nice place to sit just for the scenery, but. It's good to uh, just have a scan round with the binoculars and, and see, what, see what's going on. Grouse are, you know, the, my, my favourite bird in the world. Uh, I live for grouse. There's nothing else I'd rather do. This is exactly what I want to do for the rest of my life. Tivera view allotments in the coastal village of Cushendall. Give us the legs, the legs, the mannequin's legs. <laughs> Margaret McKillop and other members of the Cairns resident group are getting ready for Halloween. It's their biggest fundraiser of the year. We're now in our seventh year, I think it is. We have a haunted house and a ghost train. And we have about 400 wains coming. Oh, take it off. I'm wondering, is it all right for this one? There's a number on. Most of those mannequins, they were bought at a car boot sale. Right. Yeah. And some, <laughs> some of them's just got legs, so it's just trying to work out every year which one fits. Aye, there, there's about 10 different arms. There's some of them as uh, odd arms. Our allotments project has been up and running since 2013. We're very lucky with this site. We've taken in the whole of the mountains and the spectacular views that comes with it. Anybody that comes up here just loves to sit up in the middle of the meadow and just look around them. We change every year. There were zombies one year. Last year I done like a butcher, and um, this year I'm doing chucky. <laughs> so, um, so that'll be fun. People just love being scared. Nice to do. Um, it's great to even see the grown people yeah. going through the house and them actually going out crying their eyes out. Because like, <laughs> like no, not, not crying they could do. They were, they were, some of them were some crying. Of them it, was, were. it was so funny. The rivers of each glen are celebrated as much as the hills and mountains. For generations, locals have fished here for trout and for salmon returning from the sea. But despite strict catch and release rules, numbers of fish are still falling every year. Yep, I've just got a leaf caught again. It's the time of the year for leaves. Sean McElhatton has fished the River Dunn since he was 16. 
the Glensman would actually say that I'm not a Glensman because I'm from what's known as over the mountain. I'm in Loch Gill, which would be just on the edge of the glens. But I feel like a Glensman. I've been fishing in the glens 30 odd years, so I think I'll class myself as a Glensman, you know. <laughs> Salmon fishing as massive in the glens. All these wee rivers and tributaries are running down through the villages and through the farmland, and everybody's fishing. I have seen a massive decrease in salmon numbers. I have had two salmon. I could normally say 10, 15, 20. There's members of the club who's caught nothing. Not one salmon. My theory on it is, years ago, you had two men going out in their own boat to check the net, the fixed net. Now you've got factory ships with miles and miles of nets. I don't think I'll ever see big numbers of fish returning to this river, unfortunately. Autumn is gaining a foothold in the glens. A final burst of colour before winter takes over and nature begins its long sleep. In Glendun, one of the steepest sided of the glens, farmer John McCauley and Lassie are checking on their sheep. These vehicles are excellent for us. We can take out all sorts of things, also go out to gather out sheep and all. I have been here from a child. I always loved farming. My father was here farming. It was always my home. I never had any wish to leave the glens. In my father's day, they would have had to walk every bit of this. And uh, there's 400 acres here. So there's a fair bit of walking to do. Come on, Lassie, come on, come on. Come on. These farm tracks were created by John and his son Ronan a few years ago. They soon realised the new paths could have a wider purpose. The idea was level an area by behind, set up your fence, and uh, when we were doing this, my son Ronan thought, wouldn't it be a great idea if the local people could come and walk on it and enjoy the scenery? Then we moved on to put up the fence, and unfortunately, Ronan died during the time that we're doing this. Ronan was 38. His death was sudden and completely unexpected. He died from adult sudden death syndrome, which was much similar to caught death in a child. It was an awful shock. I had been speaking to him approximately an hour beforehand, and uh, I had went with my wife to do some shopping in Palomina, and really, we were only there when we got a phone call to come home immediately from my sister. He was actually had been uh, lamb on a yo, and uh, he had just died where he was. You actually live with this on a daily basis. 
There's good days and bad days, and that's probably what it'll be for the rest of our lives. It was so hard to get over his death that I found that this was something that I could occupy myself in, and I knew I was near to him uh, when I was doing this. A lot of people who have walked this will uh, say to you that they feel, you know, something uh, very comforting about the walk. And you think that's because of him? Yeah, I do. Glen Arm marks the southernmost point of the glens. This is an ancient power base. There's been a castle here since the 13th century. The current owners are the MacDonald family, who seized the lands in 1522. Today, the estate is managed by Adrian Morrow, who grew up in the glen. Look, at this time of the year, leaf flowers are a big issue. In the gardener, he hates the leaves. Because <laughs> it's constant, you know, you're just gathering them up and they just keep coming. Glenarm's present castle was built by Randall MacDonald, the Knight Earl of Antrim, in 1636. In the walled garden, staff are picking apples to make juice. These wonderful red apples, and they try to leave them as long as they possibly can. Quite a lot to get through. Um, many baskets. We would probably have about maybe six or eight baskets to go through, and maybe more than that. My dad started here as the chauffeur in about, I think, 1958. So he worked here for the best part of 40 years. So I just grew up beside him. When I was four, I come to Lanarm. I remember my first day here, and I just could not get over it. It was the largest playground in the world. There was all these wonderful landscapes and rivers and cattle and people and so much going on. I would do everything to get to here instead of going to school. So he had a wee grey Thames van at the time and uh, I quickly learned to uh, keep a big coat in there so I would get into the back of the van before he would have his breakfast finished, hide underneath the coat and then halfway to work I'd jump up and say, surprise, I'm going with you to work, Dad. But uh, that didn't work for it. He would turn around in the car on the road and take me back to my mum and then I got my legs slapped. But uh, I quickly worked out not to jump up uh, from underneath the coat until we got to Glenarm. It was too far for him then to turn around and take me home again. At Tivera View Allotments in Cushing Dole, the annual potato harvest is underway. Edward King Edward's in there, John. Oh, very good. The old John's digging out the minute are Dublin Queens. Down there, and these would be King Edward's. And these would be, uh, this lot here would be uh, Morris Piper. So there were three different varieties here. We've grew not only the residence group, but we've brought the whole community together, socialising as well. You know, it's not only about your individual allotments, it's great for the mental health and just enjoying, you know, and being in each other's company. I think it's gelled everybody as a community. Yeah, these are our charts. These are the, we call the smallest ones because we've already had some away, you know. Now, these would be our parsnips. Now, this is the best year yet for parsnips here. A 
above Glentassi in Armoy. It's market day. Sean is here with his six-month-old calves. They manage to dirty themselves when they're on the trailer. When they go into the trailer, they walk around and rubbing each other. The experienced cattle buyers, they're not filled by me combing them. Like, if they're, if they're good calves, I'll buy them. <laughs> I just get them a wee fluff up anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so you've kept the cow for a year, so there's a lot of cost against the cow there now. Yeah. So you, you need all you get for them now, so you do. I might be slightly below target, but pretty close. Got the, got, of two that I didn't sell there, just felt it was worth a wee bit more. Uh, but there'll be another day out for them. And uh, we're all fairly happy. Back on the farm, Jared and Jess are continuing their training. Dogs and humans have had a working partnership for thousands of years, an ancient bond that Jared and Jess are now learning together. The first time seeing a proper sheepdog work would have been at my friend's house. And this would be a granddaughter of the dog I first seen. And I seen my friend, the sheep broke away, and he, he was fed, I'd just go, Jess, she was called Jess as well, just to explain that. And then she just hopped the wall. Us two, you had to stand there and do nothing. So the end goal is for me to stand here and do nothing. Heal. But as you can see, she's just chasing into the middle of them at the minute. Cheer, Jess, we'll give it a try. Come on. Heal. Heal. We're both learning off each other because I don't have a clue how to train a dog. Hey, come by, come by, come by. So come by means left and way by means right. Come by, come by. Sit, sit. Not too bad. Sit, stay, stay, stay. Ah, why are you following me? Right, walk on, walk on. Bring them over to me just. I'll have to try to get a bit more stern with her, to be honest. But for now, it's just a bit of a playmate. We're enjoying each other's company. Stay, stay. You probably earned a belly rub. Do you want a wee belly rub? How you do? Good dog. On Glenwary Hill, two sections of planted forest are coming down. 30 years ago, the, the trees were planted. They should never have, have been planted. We're going to be reseeding areas back to heather, and, and also it gets rid of what I would call a vermin hole. The foxes would use forestries like this to lay up in the day. And then at night time, they'd come out and they'd forage around the hills and they'd be eating grouse and uh, curlew chicks and snipe. And then they'd, they'd also be, they'd be damaging the hair population as well. I, I call this, this forestry here Fox Hotels as it wasn't really fit for anything else, to be honest. As well as removing some of the planted forests, the existing moor also needs regeneration. Today, Alex is burning heather to make way for new growth. There's a little bit of controversy about the heather burning. If you were to burn on a really dry day, you scorch the top, tops of the sphagnum. This is quite a heavy sort of sphagnum bed here, and uh, you've really got to pick your days. But you can see just I've just taken that moss off the top there and just look how much moisture's inside it. That's just a handful. Moors have been managed for hundreds of years. If moors weren't managed, the heather population would decline. 75% of heather in the whole world is in the UK. Without managing the heather, it would just turn rank old heather and it would just die. 
this fire in particular that we've just done now, this was nearly up to my waist, so it, it wasn't fit for anything really. A grouse couldn't reach from the bottom of the ground to the top of this heather here, so it would nearly be running out of food. Once we do burn, within a couple of months, you know, there'll be a nice fresh carpet of heather. It's, it then creates a nice foraging habitat for other species as well. Winter is coming, on the steep hills of Glendon and on the high cliffs of Fairhead, it's time to bring sheep back to the farm. Here, here, come oh back. Well, her presence is enough to scare the sheep we back. Here, come on. In these open mountains, they can run round you in circles for the cat until you get them really into a lump where you can see them all the time, they can play up on you. John will need to hurry. Down in the valley, his family and friends are gathering, including his late son, Ronan's wife, Paula, and their daughter, Natalie. Today, they have come to pay tribute and to unveil a new sign, marking the completion of Ronan's way. Ronan's way. Those we love don't go away. They walk beside us every day. Unseen, unheard, but always near. Still loved, still missed, and very dear. I love a memory of Ronan, the best husband a woman could ask for. A beloved father, son, brother, cousin, and friend. Still very raw. I think anybody who's experienced a loss, especially if somebody who's so young, it takes a lot to deal with. I dated Ronan from when I was 16, um, and unfortunately, he passed away just before our 10th wedding anniversary. So I'd say without the family and friends I've had over this past few years, um, it would have been an awful lot more difficult. Nobody really got to explore Glen Don. It was kind of one of the glens that was left behind. And Ronan's thing was always about people going out and enjoying the kind of the land that he called home. The walk, to me, it's peaceful, it's quiet. It's you can gather your own thoughts. And to me, that's, that's Ronan, you know. The nights are drawing in. Soon, it will be winter. But even the wildest weather won't dampen the spirits of a people proud to call the Glens home. <laughs> 